tuned in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, guiding your gridiron journey, none other than your host, former NFL lineman, Ross Tucker. Oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. I never do that. It is a Wisdom Wednesday. I bring it for you every single time. I'm behind the mic here on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast or any other shows for that matter. Even Money Podcast, Talking NFL Betting, the Fantasy Feast Podcast where Joe Dolan and I today will start to dive into the fantasy implications of some of these draft choices. We'll start with those six quarterbacks in the first round, what it means for them from a fantasy perspective, as well as the other guys on their team. And of course, the College Draft Podcast is just fantastic. To my knowledge, we're the only show we go over every single draft choice, right? So we're going to go in-depth on every pick, including every pick for your team, every pick for your team's division. Check out the College Draft, Fantasy Fees, Even Money, all available however you listen to this, or youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Always a good time to talk with former longtime Falcons GM Thomas Dimitrov, especially with the Falcons being in the news. Now, truth be told, this conversation, which I think you'll find very, very interesting, actually took place at the Super Bowl. It's uh, a fascinating talk into what Thomas is doing now and where things are going in NFL front offices. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. Always good to work uh, and talk with, uh, I guess, a former colleague. Although it's funny, when we were in New England together, Thomas, Thomas Dimitrov, who I told you about earlier in the show, the former Atlanta Falcons general manager, when you're a player and you're in the front office, our interaction is almost non-existent. So we were colleagues in New England in 2005 and 2006, but maybe said hi to each other one time in the cafeteria. It's not as, uh, there's almost no overlap, or very little at least, between players and and people in the front office. Especially in New England, right? Yeah. It was very different in Atlanta. Well, maybe as a general manager it was different, but I agree, isn't it? It's a little bit of a hey and a nod and everything. I remember being in the hallways in New England. It was definitely set up that way. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I got a bunch of things to talk with you about. I know because we've had uh, we had Mike Mayock on back in January talking about Sumer Sports, and he referenced you. So just before I get into other questions with things that happened this offseason with GMs getting a second chance and talk about Belichick and Vrabel, just uh, give me an update on Sumer Sports, how things are going there, and where kind of you guys are at with that process. So Sumer Sports, we're two years in, uh, which is crazy. We started with just three of us. We're at 60 people now, data wow. scientists, engineers. We hired, back to Mike Mayock, we hired an internal scouting staff, which w- the reason we did very quickly is no team is going to give you their IP outright and their grades, right? We decided let's just go out and hire the best people that were available. We hired Mike Mayock. We hired John Idzik. We hired Phil Emery. We hired Rod Graves, even though he's you know, in charge of Fritz Pollard. He's involved with us. And then we have you know 10 other scouts. That's a big part for us, right? Because we come up with our own internal grading, and then we can work off of it and present to the teams. The other thing we're doing right now, again, remember, roster optimization. This isn't about making calls for a coach and, and putting that information in front of them. That's a different part of the third party. For us, we are focused on building teams. And we, we're putting out a product this year that is – So, do you know Blesto and National? Of course, yeah. Really good, reputable. Yeah, I think they both gave me a reject rate. But yeah, no, well, <laughs> look, I, I worked for them back then. I, I know you smile about it. It's true, though. I mean, the difference that we have, and we don't think we're replacing for them, we're putting out a product right now that is is all of our scouting information combined. So it's subjective combined with the analytics, the objective analytic that we have. And now we present them with all of the league grades and all of the top 800 every year. So it's, it's just another opportunity to reach out to the NFL teams and, and have them interact with data. All right, so when you say roster optimization, what, what, what are you guys really trying to accomplish or, or, or do here? So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, here, here, is, here are the best picks for you. You can juxtapose to yours if you're whatever organization, the Atlanta Falcons, you look at our grades, just our, our raw grades from our scouting group, and then you look at our SAGE grade. It's, it's our proprietary name of how we combine all of our analytics with the grades that we have from our, from our organization. And then you, you compare to your grades, and you compare. It, it basically adds, in the NFL, we are all about comparatives. 
when you're in the scouting and you're in the building of the team. So it just gives us an opportunity to fold in a lot of analytics and data for a team to say, wow, we have a six on this guy. Sumer Sport has a 7.2. Why is that? Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make that call. Eventually, we hope. If you guys can track us and see in three years that we're 70% and the rest of the league is 42% or 39%, then it works in our favor. Right. All right. So I, I have also a couple things off-season related that I'm really curious to ask you about. The first one is, you know, the, the big theme, I guess, Thomas, of the off-season hiring cycle as it relates to coaches Whereas teams did not want to hire coaches that have had personnel say in the past or would like personnel say, you know, Bill Belichick got shut out. Pete Carroll got shut out. Mike Vrabel got shut out, which really surprised me because you can't even hold the age thing against Vrabel, right? Um, I, I guess I'm curious to get your perspective because you've really been around both organizations. Like you've been where, it was coach driven. You've been in Atlanta, where you you it was more driven uh, by by you as as the GM. Just kind of your thoughts of that trend in the NFL. Do you think it's a good trend? I would imagine most GMs like that because they they want to have the personnel say and not the coaches. I want to give you a blank slate on what we saw transpire this offseason. First of all, I was blown away, I, unfathomable that Bill Belichick doesn't have a job right now as a head coach in this league. I thought it was going to happen in Atlanta, and we can talk about that in a minute. Mike Vrabel, there was a spot even before Dan Quinn came to the table in, in uh, Washington where I thought, they're going to be three top-notch coaches in my mind, in a scale, right? The great, the best ever, you can argue, all the way down to, not all the way down, to very, very good coaches yeah. and these guys. Look, my feeling is a young general manager like Adam Peters, he normally – as I did, you'll want to kick off your time as a general manager. When you finally get to that spot, the last thing you want to do is have some heavy presence around you, right? You want to you want to be a part of building a team finally. The great thing I think that Adam has with Dan Quinn is Dan is so collaborative. Dan knows a lot about personnel and he enjoys it, but the two of them can work together well. So that's a little bit of a different situation. When you bring a guy like Bill Belichick in or Mike Vrabel, who are both very, very strong men and who are going to require the ability to make the calls within the organization, interior, maybe not. Like Bill, if, if Bill were to come into to, uh, Atlanta, he had said that he would work with Terry Fontenot. But I think the people in the building probably think, yeah, Bill's going to come in, but he's still going to have final say, and that's complicated. I think there are a lot of people in the general manager role who just want to make sure that they are doing what is right, and they're the experts in personnel. They don't want head coaches coming in, making calls on personnel, heavy-handed calls when they're not necessarily the right calls. And look, the reality is a lot of head coaches are so busy during the season, they're not like the they're not like the GMs who have worked on the personnel, free agency, and the draft for 14 months. Right, Ross? That's a big thing. They come in after the season and they start watching a couple games here and there. And not all of them, but some do. Yeah. And I think that's complicated for general managers. Right, because it's like this guy just flies in – and wants to overtake the process that we've been spending so much time on. Probably deflating for the scouting staff. It is deflating, but if you have a good guy, again, I keep coming back to Dan. Dan Quinn, you talk to the scouting staff, there's not, there's not a better head coach out there that they want to work with than Dan, more than Dan Quinn because Dan is going, to be in, in, is going to be involved in the right way. He's going to interact with the scouts. I mean, he has a great time you know, spending time with the specialty side of the scouts, right? That's a big thing for a head coach. Most don't. Most will be crowding up their playbook. They'll come in, meet with the GM, and then move on. A lot of that. And that's not, that's not Dan. So I'm excited to watch Adam Peters and Dan Quinn work together. And that's really what it came down to is a lot of these different places, they had a GM in place. And because I'm sitting there thinking with the Belichick thing in Atlanta, Terry Fano and Rich McKay, they don't want Belichick going in there. I mean, how does that help them? I mean, that, that, the, 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 the next step is not those guys getting promotions or getting more money. It's maybe them getting knocked out of there. Yeah, I mean, that survival element of it, right? But from the very beginning, it was pretty public that Rich was going to step aside. You know, not step aside. He was just named CEO of, of AMBSE, Sports and Entertainment, Arthur Sports and Entertainment. So he was going to be up and doing a lot of stuff at the very high level. So I don't think that was as much of an issue. I think it was it was what you're saying. I think there were a number of people inside the building who were like, well, 
what direction does this go? This may even go to the salary cap guy, Chris Olson. I'm not putting him him saying you know in that saying that he was causing all kinds of turmoil in there. But you know, when you're a cap guy, you're wondering who's who's coming in or if someone's going to replace you. That is a big deal, right, in the league when there's a new head coach or a strong general manager coming in. Uh, do you think he'll have a job next year, Belichick? I do believe so. Yeah. And quite honestly, in a roundabout way, I've talked to people who, even even GMs who are, you know, saying like, look, if if my situation were to be different or if I could convince my owner, I might consider a change because how many times you get a chance to take Bill Belichick and, and, and it's it's very rare. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a GM and an ownership group, in my mind. That sounds inflamed or exaggerated, but I believe it. Most times those guys retire in their own organization. They don't come available to the general masses. Right. Holy smokes. That's incredible. It's a really good point. What about, um, Thomas, I think we've talked about this before. It's so rare, speaking of guys like Belichick or Rabel or Pete Carroll, so rare for a general manager like yourself to ever get a second a second bite at the apple, to ever get a second chance, which I think is interesting because there are – we'll see how Dan Quinn does. We'll see how some Raheem Morris does, right? But there are some pretty, you know, high-level examples of guys like Pete Carroll, like Bill Belichick, doing much better in their second stint, yet it's so rare. I mean, off the top of my head, I can think of – you know, Mike Tannenbaum sort of with the Jets and the Dolphins, and now this offseason, Tom Telesco, which is really rare to just go from one team to another team in the same division. I can't think of that many other times where people were able to get, you know, a second GM job. Yeah, I mean, I think Rick Spielman ended up doing it right when he was down in, in Miami. Um, Trent Balky, obviously at Jacksonville. Yeah. He goes in there, works with Dave Caldwell, and eventually takes over there. So there are some. I mean, I have my strong uh, Martin Mayhew w- with uh, with the Commanders. Now that may change, of course, yeah. with, with Adam being there. Of course, it will. Yeah. I, all I'm saying there is head coaches more GMs. I have some feelings about that. I mean, I have feelings that when you're a head coach, people know what your your world was around the league, so that if they need your style, they're going to bring you in. They don't really know the GM style, so it's not right. like. If you get fired from a team, another team saying, wow, I need Dimitrov's style in this organization, so I'm going to go out and hire him. They automatically, I feel nowadays, are going to youth. And I think they're going to youth. I have some strong feelings about this as well. I think there are presidents out there who are making sure that they're trying to put together their their group and they can work well with the general manager coming in. If they bring in a power hitter like Scott Pioli, Jerry Reese, um, Rick, whoever they are, it, Kevin Colbert's not coming back in. Yeah, that that makes it complicated for a president who's firmly entrenched in the building, and wondering how am I going to work with this person along with this new head coach and a strong general manager? Because at that point, the business president ends up being kind of pushed aside a little bit, and it's a it's a very interesting. And that's not a negative. But what presence. are we doing if it feels like all so many of these decisions, whether it's um, you know which GM to hire or which coach to hire it's almost like let's get the younger guy and it's almost like it's not because of the youth it's because you want the opportunity to control them or it's your own job insecurity that that's not that's not that's not um optimized to go back to sumer sports that's not an optimized decision making it it definitely is not and again the the element of survival the element of making sure that you th- you're going to be continuing to work together in a building is important. However, to your point on, you're not just bringing in a young guy because you think you shouldn't be bringing in a young guy because you think that it's going to make everything easier and and smoother. You should bring him in because that guy is incredibly smart. He's been around a paradigm that has been very successful. Like that's a big thing, right? Uh, All I'm saying is I think we step back to your point here. And I would say this completely respectfully to the ownership group. When you're bringing your group together, to pick the next head coach and the next general manager, you really look at your search group and make sure there's not a whole bunch of ulterior motives. If there are, to me, I think it's a ridiculous search uh, system. Yeah. Because like you just said, you might have eight guys on that, on that search, in that search group who are littered throughout your organization and you think they're there because they're giving you some good feedback. It's human nature. Oh my gosh. I want to make sure I don't bring this guy in. He's going to bring this salary cap guy in. I've just used that as example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's a big deal. 
And the other thing I think, Thomas, is like for some GMs, like I think Itzik might have only gotten one year with the Jets, maybe two. But for a lot of them, you know, it's similar to coaches. Like with coaches, I feel like people can say, well, he never had a quarterback or he never had this. Whereas with guys in the front office, it's like, well, if they didn't win because if they didn't win, it's their fault because they got to pick the coach and they got to pick the quarterback. You think that's part of it too? Where it's like, you can at least say, let's just say Arthur Smith, okay? And since we're talking a lot about Atlanta, Arthur Smith, like, I mean, Desmond Ritter, like Arthur Smith, did he have a top 20 quarterback the last couple of years to give him a chance? Because what I always say is you look at all the guys that got fired, the coaches, Carolina, New England, Washington, Atlanta, there's not a top 20 quarterback among them, right? right? Like that's how you get fired. But I feel like for GMs, you get the blame for not having gotten the quarterback. And I think that's why they don't get a second chance as much. And that's a great point. And and there's no question about it in my mind. You are judged by your big decisions as a general manager. One, the most important, obviously, is picking a quarterback, right? If you fail on the quarterback and everything else goes awry in the next two years, yes, you're out and you're never back in because you are judged by that ultimate move. But I also believe you're, all, you're judged by other moves around. So you can see some of the GMs who have established themselves. I mean, Howie, Les Snead. I mean, uh, who else? I mean, well, I, those are two yeah, yeah. really good examples who moved you know, on. Brad Holmes now. I mean, I know it's new, yeah, it's yeah. young, but sure. still. But they moved on from their quarterbacks, what I'm saying, and they've survived because they are very good at what they do. Right. However, it does come back to moves in the past. When you look at it, if you haven't hit on your quarterback and, of course, your head coach, you get two chances, I think, as a, head, as a GM with your head coach. I don't know if you do necessarily as, you know, putting your, yourself on the line for that quarterback. If that fails, man, your owner's looking at you with a really, you know, sort of wry eye. Yeah, it's interesting, like, of all people to kind of get a second chance. I, I like Tom Telesco. I think he got some good players with the Chargers. But, man, I guess I, what I would argue is there are certainly other former GMs that have much better resumes than Tom Telesco that have, to my knowledge, never even gotten an interview or a sniff of a second job, which always makes you wonder, like, how that worked, how that happened. What about this? Because you and I might have talked about this at some point. What about the uh, the money for GMs? Because there was a time, and maybe it's still that way, where head coaches make like double or triple or whatever GMs make, which I always think is interesting. And I've actually told them this, like, because they do the Eagles preseason games. I mean, if I was an owner, one of the first things I would do was basically give a guy like Howie Roseman almost whatever he wants yeah. because – his ability to get the right players and to be able to like, do a good job hiring coaches. And Jeffrey Lurie does a fantastic job with that, heavily involved owner in that part of this, the operation. But I, 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 I had heard, and maybe it's changed or gotten better, but the GMs weren't getting nearly the pay that coaches were, which I think is interesting. For Especially every- since a lot of times they're the boss. They're, they're the one that helps pick the coach. I mean, let's just call it the way it was. A matter of, matter of 10 plus years ago, the salary base for a for a GM was like a million dollars. There's a high water mark right now of, the, of over six million dollars a year, which is huge. But contrast that to the head coaches out there who are over ten and beyond. You're exactly First right. First year head coaches are now it's, getting like nine or ten. That's unbelievable. So, but but the point to that is exactly like where do you start bridging that gap? Because back in the day, the GM was tucked away a little bit, and they could last two or three co- coaches. Now they are right in the middle of it. When something goes awry with an organization, they're getting peppered on all kinds of stuff just as a head coach is. Never used to be that way. Thomas, uh, last question for you. Uh, just give me like the biggest trend that you would notice in the league right now from Sumer Sports or the data you guys have gotten um, or maybe how teams are using analytics. And maybe it is using, using what you guys do in Sumer Sports. But for someone that's been out of the league as long as I have, what would I be most surprised by if I were in the personnel meetings or the coaching staff meeting? Is it the analytics stuff and how prominent it is or no? Well, I think it's gaining prominence, and I think it's, it is it is over the next three to five years going to be a massive move in evolution in the league, I think. And I say this not being a martyr. Understand that. I bring my buddies aside who are GMs, and I'm saying, look, you want to parlay this into two and three more contracts? Come in with an understanding that it's going to be football the core and yet you're going to fold in the right amount of data so that you are showing your owner that you're being more academic about it. And I, and this is not, again, we said it last year, and I hate to th- throw this phrase in, 
this is not like the idea of black box. This is about working together in that situation. So I do believe I have a lot of general managers saying to me, like, I'm really interested in how I can utilize this, but I don't want it to come in here and, and like eradicate strong word, yeah. half my, my scouting staff, right. right? I want to make sure that we are still football at the core and we're able to augment. And so to your point, yeah, I think you're seeing a lot of, of, of um, headway in hiring more substantial data staffs so that you can tap into, create work for, you know, the, the coaching decisions, but then also on the roster side, they're realizing the importance of that. And again, I could go on and on. I know you talked yeah. to Eric Eager about it. The net, the net net of it is, you have to be more open-minded as a GM in today's world when you're building your football team. The gut stuff is not hand, it doesn't work anymore. And here's an here's an odd little thing. You're seeing a lot of the sons. We were talking about it earlier. The sons of the owners who are now 80s. Yeah, 70, yeah, yeah. These guys are so much more dialed into data. So they're saying to their dads, like, "Hey, dad, this GM or this head coach, he, he he's not putting any foot forward on the movement here." And, and now those owners who are listening to their sons because they want their sons to come up and eventually take their business, they're saying, wow, son, that's interesting. So he's not looking into this. No, he's not. He's not folded in this. I looked online and I saw that, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so we are behind. And so the owner obviously starts pressing a little bit more. I think you're going to find that a lot. The owner's son's probably going to sumersports.com, <laughs> which is what Thomas Dimitrov and his team are doing. Thanks so much. Great to see you again this year. Always great. Thank you. Man, I, I really enjoy him and talking with Thomas. I think it's almost like an annual thing now at this Super Bowl. I should I should reach out to him this week to get his thoughts on the the pick that uh, made all the noise with the Michael Penix Jr. pick. Which, by the way, that's what I wrote about this week in my column at the Thirty Third Team. So make sure you follow me on social media at Ross Tucker NFL. I I don't think you can post it to Instagram, but I'll post to Twitter and Facebook that column. So you can read my thoughts. You can also drink Labatt Blue Light while you're reading my thoughts. Why not? It'll make my article even better. It makes everything better. Drinking Labatt Blue Light with your friends, family, living life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly. Beer, Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. Tux Takes. All right, Ross. The most interesting thing since Monday is Mike Reese is reporting that the Giants and the Vikings both offered multiple first round picks to New England Patriots to try to get the third overall pick. And I think this is the meatiest thing since Monday. So we'll call this the meaty Monday for the week presented by GoodRanchers.com. America's best meat delivered to your door. Use code Ross for 15% off a better way to buy meat at GoodRanchers.com. This is why, you know, details of trade offers like this rarely get out. And frankly, it's a shame they do get out. You know, so obviously somebody on the Patriot side leaked it to Mike Reese because it makes it look better that the Patriots liked Drake May that much, that they turned down these offers, that the pick was that valuable, that the Vikings and Giants wanted him. But it's a rough look for the Giants and the Vikings, especially for Daniel Jones and J.J. McCarthy. I mean, J.J. McCarthy's all excited to get drafted by the Vikings pretty clear with the Vikings willing to give up three first-round picks that they were looking to move up to number three to try to get Drake May. I've seen some people say, well, they could have been doing that for J.J. McCarthy. No, 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 no. Use some logic here, right? If they were going to do that for J.J. McCarthy, they would have been able to trade at some other point between 4 and 10 to make sure they got McCarthy. Just not good when trade details like this come out for some of the parties involved. Some contract news will stick in New England. Christian Barmore, he gets a four-year extension with the Patriots that includes $42 million guaranteed. Travis Kelsey, he gets a new contract in Kansas City that gives him a $4 million raise this season. And while his brother Jason's going to be with ESPN this season. Right. The other news, not as important. Bills signed Quintez Cephas. Raiders signed Michael Gallup. Rams signed Boston Scott. Jags cut Zay Jones over the last couple of days as teams tinker with their rosters post-draft. Well, Travis Kelsey and Jason Kelsey both deserve it. Uh, you know, what those guys have done, neither one of them first-round pick, not even second-round pick, to have the careers on and off the field they have is just ridiculous. As for Barmore... I don't think he played football, Jack, until his senior year at Newman Garetti High School in Philadelphia. And all of a sudden, there was this big monster killing everybody. That was Christian Barmore. Now he gets the biggest contract 
other than Tom Brady in Patriots history, which is just bananas to say. I think we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also check out Even Money, Fantasy Feast, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV+, Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. Shout out MyFrontPageStory.com. Guys, it's M- M- May. May is for moms. MyFrontPageStory.com. Get her the best gift anyone's ever gotten her for Mother's Day. Forward me the receipt, Ross at RossTucker.com. I guarantee I'll sign a, uh, I'll sign something and send it to you in the mail. LoveBackOfficeSchedule.com, SteakhouseSports.com, HumanHeadNYC.com, Sportaculture, Pizza Boy Brewing.